Hi, I'm Stephen Hand. Today we're going to look at the Golden Eagle Revolution Bow. Now you're going to say, what's this? What's Golden Eagle? Well, Golden Eagle is an old company. And when I'm going to say old, it was it probably stopped existing in, I'm going to guess, um, 2020. So it was Golden Eagle actually purchased the Bear Jennings brand and then it renamed itself to Bear. So at that point, Golden Eagle disappeared. Um, but the staff were all the same, the factory was all the same, and yeah. So this is the Golden Eagle Revolution. Um, now back in the day, so when was this bow made? N roughly, I'm gonna guess, um, 1994, 1995. This was state-of-the-art bow. Um, in fact, my mother shot um, the cheaper version of this, which was called the Golden Eagle Evolution. The Revolution had the machine riser, the Evolution was a cast riser and I think she got second in the Nationals in Australia shooting target with her and I think second or first in field. Um, so what made this bow unique and what made this bow um, as what I considered one of the good selling bows of that time. The other good selling bows of that time was the um, Jennings Carbon Extreme. Um, but at the time, there was um, Martin was big in, in that era, um, but at this time, this was seen to be a well-budgeted um, bow with state-of-the-art technology. So let's just have a look at this bow. So to start off with, it's got a machine riser. Um, now, machine risers had been around, um, but they were considered um, sort of, you know, top quality. A lot of the bows back in that era were cast riser. So, now this bow in mass weight wasn't too bad. It's probably about 4.2. A lot of the machine risers were really heavy. So, it had the option here for two-piece quiver, which lots of people liked. And it had two... Um, arrow rest holes which obviously some companies are making a big deal about in 2020 but this has been around for years and years and years um, the limb pockets here were metal um, now the limbs these are a recurve limbs it was considered back in the 1990s that recurve limbs were better than straight limbs now no one could tell you why well they'd say it's smoother because it flexes evenly over the limb but probably that was just sales dribble um, because today you don't see recurve limbs on compounds that are all straight and all compression limbs um, there's really nothing left like this on the market but at the time you paid a premium for a recurve limb and straight limbs were available but they were cheaper um, so basically everyone opted for recurve limbs because they were meant to be better they look better I think um, now the recurve limb is not actually un under pressure it's actually shaped this way so with a recurve bow it's um flex that way and then you flex it back to create the recurve. The compound recurve limbs are not like that. It's actually molded in this shape. So just to look like this. Now the bow featured a twin cam with yoke system on either side. The yoke system enables you to um, t tune the bow for cam lean, um, top and bottom. And you can see it's a teardrop kind of design. Now this bow came with a series of modules that you just fitted to the bow two screws, you didn't need a bow press, and the module just clipped in, cl clipped on. It was a plastic module here. Now this bow um, was adjustable from 23 to 27 inches in draw length, which was perfect for like the um, lady, the smaller adult. Um, so I'm gonna say oh, some other things about it. Now the, um, because you've got yokes, they kind of place the cam in the middle. So today we don't have yokes, largely we don't have yokes. And what they do is they shim the bow to get the cam to be straight. With the yoke system, you just basically increase or decrease the tension on the cables to get these cams to be straight. Um, so back in the early days of this bow design, it came with steel cables. And you can see the hole here just to there, that's where the steel cable um, went through and the string actually fitted onto the end of the metal um, cable there. You could then convert these to full fast light, which was seen, cables were seen to be a little bit quicker at the time, but then fast light was eventually seen to be more stable. That's when I say stable, if a steel cable breaks, it's a big it's a big deal where the fast flight strings were not breaking. However, fast flight's not like the 452 material that we use today. It, it used to stretch and move. So you don't get the consistency with these bows that you did back in, that you do with the modern bows today. So um, cable guard, 
down the bottom here, no um, string stops. Um, what's interesting, the cable guard ran on the outside. Um, these days you see the cable guard more up towards the center of the grip here to, to, to take out the, um, the pressure on the cables to avoid cam lean. Um, it came with a basic sight. Um, the basic arrow rest here, now these are obviously aftermarket products fitted, but it's, it's in this era. Um, now what do I want to mention about this boat? So back in the days, back in the 90s, boat companies would come out with technology that they would say is groundbreaking that will be around forever. And this boat featured one of those things, so I want to show you that. So back in the 1990s, or back in the Back in the days when they first used to make bows, it was always considered you had to have your cams in time, okay? So you see here, you've got a little line down here, so you can use that line to see if it's in alignment, see if your cams are out of time. So you can check both bottom, bottom and top with this line here. Now, if it's not in time, then what you gotta do is you gotta twist up the cables to get it in time, okay? But if you don't have a bow press, that's a problem. So what Golden Eagle developed was this system here. So you had a spanner, which came with the bow, like a little, um, it wasn't a spanner, it was a ring spanner, which came with a bow. And on the other side, there's an Allen key. So what you do is you put your Allen key in there, the spanner in there, and you'd move this to get the cam timing correctly, to, to get the cam time correct. So basically what you're doing here is increasing or decreasing the size of the cam um, to get the timing correct. So this design probably stayed in the market for two to three years. Um, Martin had something similar where you can adjust the size of the yoke um, with an Allen key. So the limbs, you can see they sort of start off skinny, go fat, and then go skinny. This is kind of still existent. This type of design in the Bear Jennings range of 2020, um, but obviously not in a single limb. The concept of this was, this is the work area here, so they made the limb fatter in that spot um, to make it more durable. Now these limbs were pretty durable. There, there were, um, in, the first, in the first bows, you used to get some little cracks down here, and that was through the cams basically not being timed correctly, so these limbs would be twisting, and you'd get some cracks down here. I didn't get many warranties, um, but I did get some. Um, it had a nice, comfortable wood grip, um, and some of the models on the Evolution, you could change the angle of the grip from there to kind of there. It used to have a little Allen key in the handle here, and you used to push the Allen key in, and that would change the angle on the grip. Um, in the day, this bow used to sell for around $800. Um, now, you need to put things in, into perspective, so let me put that into perspective for you. Um, in 1994, 95, when I think this bow was made, um, my salary as a public servant um, was around 600 a week, and this bow cost around 800 a week. Um, my salary now, if I was in the public service, I would, at the same level, probably is best to put it, it would be around um, 2,000 a week, maybe a little bit more at the same level as I was in 1994. Um, yeah, so I'd be on, I'd be on two thousand a week, and two thousand a week. Now you buy yourself the top of the range bow, um, where this was a, w a bit over a week salary um, for me to buy this bow. Um, so now, basically, archery gear is significantly cheaper as far as real world wages. And now, if I was in the public service, my salary would be closer to probably four, closer to four thousand a week. Um, anyway, um, knocking point, that's what we used to use and the, the release aid used to come up under there. That created problems because it used to create pinch on the knocking point. It used to basically, as you're pulling back with the release aid, the string would be angled so sometimes a knock would pop off and you'd dry fire your bow and that would cause a lot of breakages. That has been reduced the number of breakages with D-loops. Um, Oh, the other thing worth mentioning is the center serving here is like a fishing line material, like a monofilament, they called it. Now we're using braided um, cord. So when this used to break, the whole lot would just basically fall apart. 
with the braided it's a gradual wear thing now it doesn't just pop off um, so anyway, this bow yeah 1994 so let's put a d-loop on it and let's have a couple of shots and see what it feels like okay so I've set up the golden eagle with a d-loop um, now one of the things with shooting an old bow if you're familiar with shooting an old bow you probably have got the memory of this being a really nice bow to shoot um, and I'm gonna say memories are flawed um, because what you think was good um, 20 years ago probably wasn't um, so now I'm gonna say people used to shoot really what good scores with these bows um, I had a person shooting the Nationals I think he was about 30 or 40 points ahead shooting one of these and I was like yay someone's gonna win because um, I was the Australian distributor for Golden Eagle at the time and I was like someone's gonna win the Nationals with um, my bow and I was like yes um, and then they told him with two targets to go and he missed the next two targets um, so that was a bit unfortunate um, so what used to make this bow nice and why why did it used to sell um, above the other bows in the marketplace um, for me um, the weight was good um, the balance I think was pretty good you can see the balance is excellent the weight was about 4.3 the draw cycle was smooth it came with modules which offered draw length adjustability. Uh, the price point was good. It came in this mossy oak camo. Um, they had two piece quivers for it. They had matching arrow rests for it. Basically, it was a hunting kit um, made, made for hunters. So with a fork arrow rest, the arrow is going to be wide enough to sit on the fork so I can't shoot my normal VAPs. Now this bow was left in um, my old shop and was, hasn't been picked up after five years um, and that's more than common with a lot of bows. I think what happened was he's probably um, dropping the bow in to get his string replaced because you can see like a couple of strands there being busted. Now what you want to check to make sure the knock fits on um, the string well you can see that fits on okay um, so I'm happy to shoot this now you can see there a little bit of serving movement um, that was more than common with this um, with this you know type of serving so let's see how it goes so we'll just tr test out the draw cycle now I'm being careful I haven't drawn this bow back so I'm drawing away from my face so if something blows it's not going to blow into my face because that would just be messy and if you're in the if you're dating that's not a good look to have a messy face unless the girls like that sort of stuff oh that's a it's a very short draw length um, so it starts off here it's quite hard and now it's dropping 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 and it's like spongy like really really spongy um, back here so what's happened with bows today in 2020 the limbs have got parallel which means there's no movement of the bow forward and they generally have draw stops now and what the draw stops do is when you come over that valley it just locks in place you can see this bow rocks um, when you draw it back um, so you get that value you've got this basically that much where you can kind of sit the bow and that leads to some inconsistencies now people obviously shot well with these bows in the time so what they do is they draw in the valley and then draw hard into that um, valley so let's just try that and take the shot So the bow makes substantially more noise than the current bows and part of that is through these strings you can see how slack they are on the bow now you can't do that with a modern compound bow because today you've got compression limbs which are putting a lot more tension on these strings and cables um, the bow itself you know it feels nice enough to shoot there's a bit of hand shock forward when you shoot the bow um, obviously this draw length is way 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 too too short for me um, but you know like if you're looking to buy an old compound bow like this um, <laughs> you 
Look, they shoot fine. There's nothing wrong with them. If the limbs haven't broken, they're probably never going to. Um, the risers themselves are strong because you know the bows don't produce the energy that the modern ones do today. Um, so they're pretty bulletproof bows. Um, the type of people who'd be buying these are people who are looking for a collector's bow. They used to shoot one then when they were younger. Finger shooters because the bow's longer axle axle, so you can shoot this bow with fingers. Um, are the type of people who buy this. Now, what are you going to pay for a bow like? the Golden Eagle Revolution or the Golden Eagle Evolution. Um, now the Evolution used to sell for about $100, $150 cheaper with cast riser. Look, with an old bow, I'm gonna say, you know, probably you wanna be picking them up around $80 to $100. Um, and you could argue they're worth more. And yes, you know, they are probably, but as soon as you go to that $500 price point, and I'm talking Australian dollars, you're talking you know, brand new PSE Stinger, which is just an awesome bow with a draw stop. Um, it's gonna outshoot something like this every day of the week. Um, a secondhand Stinger's gonna sell for around 250. So for me, I'm thinking you wanna pick these up around the 80, 80 odd dollars. Um, one of the things to watch out for is the strings because if you need more strings for it, it's gonna cost you 130, so you don't wanna spend $80 on a bow, have to put new strings on it. So then it, the price jumps to 200 and you're like, uh. But look, if the bow's in decent condition and you're looking for something just to hang on the wall, a um, bit of history, check it out. Um, I think this was one of the bows of that era, which really um, had a, had an impact in the sport of around the 1990s. Um, I'm going to say probably the um, evolution with the adjustable grip had a few other features, um, a few other features with the adjustable grip, um, but the plastic grip was fatter. So the evolution came with a, um, it also came with a wood grip or an adjustable plastic grip, but I think it was a little bit wider than the wood grip. But that's the logo just there. So I'm Stephen Hand. Um, thanks for watching and enjoy your archery. Bye.